Do you need encouragement to turn tragedies into your own triumphant life story? If so, this podcast is for you. Listen to powerful guests who have persevered through challenges so you can gain strength to build your championship life. The host of Professor of Perseverance Podcast, Dr. James Perdue. Hey, come on in. It's that time again. Hey, it's that season. We're getting closer, closer. We just passed old Turkey Day. Now we're getting ready for old big Saint Nick to come on down the chimney. And along with that, we're going to get some motivation and inspiration. We're going to get some little golden nugget that's going to help you get through today. Because we know life comes and sometimes it's not pretty. And what happens? We get through it. It comes again. What do we do? We take the information we learned earlier to get through a situation and we use it again. Simple as that. And we pass it on, right? Share it to someone else. Let them be able to experience how you are able to get through a real tragedy so they can use it to get through. Do they will pay it forward? It's that time of the year to pay it forward, right? For always saying, Nick, hey, today our guest here to speaking, uh, talking with us today, uh, grew up with some child tragedy. Usually when we hear that, uh, we think of really the uh, bad parts, you know, with the abuse. And uh, she's going to tell her story a little bit about uh, how the synth- uh, synthetic, is that it? Synthetic? Is that it? No, synthetic. Is that it? Is that how you say it? Satanic. Okay. Santanic. There we go. Thank you. And so now you just heard a little brief, um, brief from her. So there we have to welcome to the show, Lauren Nelson. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much. And Brittany, thank you for coming in. Hey, tell AJ, I said, hey. All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, hey, oh, it's you, Brittany. We're back to you. No, no, we're not back to Lauren. All right, Lauren. I told you well, earlier, this, I'm not a professional. Dude, but <laughs> we, we have a good time and we learn and uh, we're going to help people in the long run. So Sounds good to me. All right. So let's get into this. Um, some Satanism going on as you're growing up. And I this is my first story with this. And yeah. so we'll, I want to learn from it and, you know, get some ideas. And, and again, uh, I'm not sure what to ask and everything, but you start us off where you think we need to belong and go from there. Okay. And uh, Brittany, if you have any questions or AJ got any questions, uh, I'm sure to let us know. We'll go from there. All right, Lauren, the platform is you. Okay, sounds great. I know this topic is a really intense topic. And for a lot of people, they've never maybe even heard that this happens. Um, you know, it's kind of on the periphery of society. It's something that's in the shadows. It's in darkness. That's what it, where it wants to be. And, uh, and it's, it's difficult and it's hard. So for anybody who's listening right now, I know that this topic is difficult. Um, and it may be hard to hear, but I'm not going to go into a ton of details. So don't worry about. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, we, we just need an idea what yeah, you know, we don't, we don't exactly. need the whip and chain and bruise and, no. and all that. No, that, that's we didn't run it. Cause uh, again, we want to know just what you've been through yeah, and then how we evolved out of it and where you're at. So, yeah, that's wonderful. No, that's perfect. And I, and I never feel like it ever helps to share any details anyway. So basically um, for me, uh, fear has been a huge part of my life since the time that I was four years old, which is when that, um, that those few events happened for me. So at four years old, um, First of all, I grew up in a really, really loving home, a Christian home. My parents were fantastic. Um, I, have a, I have a twin sister. She's absolutely wonderful. So I had a really safe, loving home. But when we got on an airplane and flew to another state to visit some extended family members uh, when I was four years old, that's when um, the abuse happened and when my eyes were open to realizing oh, that, okay. the, yeah, that there was I, a I thought it was going to be family with this family but it's extended yeah okay i was thinking immediate okay all right thank goodness thank goodness because (laughs) when you opened up and said a loving family and then in my head i'm going wait wait a second yeah Yeah. okay now (laughs) how can they be loving and no they're not exactly so all right now we're on the same page aj thank you for coming in buddy 
All right. Yeah. I mean, for, it's a, and for people that have gone through, you know, having their actual immediate family do these things to them, it is even harder to mm. come out of it because it, the, what it does on the brain, physically, emotionally, spiritually, it is so difficult. And then for me, I had it happen on a few occasions um, because what would happen is my parents would put my sister and I to sleep in a, in one of the bedrooms um, at this extended family member's house. And then in the middle of the night, um, these people would come in and take my sister and I, we would be put in a car and driven to another location. And at that location is, is where there were other men and women and sadly other kids that were there to be abused as well. And what I learned very quickly is that these, these, these adults that were there were not safe. <laughs> um, they were acting inappropriately with each other, with children, and they also were there to worship Satan. And so it was their their means of gaining control. Um, and that's what they sought after was really power. Yeah. Oh, exactly. That's what a lot of this is on any type of abuse. It's usually the power over the controlling is what it's going after main thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the things that I experienced there, you you can imagine and you can't imagine, which is okay. I mean, it's it's basically any, you know, sexual abuse, um, emotional abuse, and spiritual abuse. Their main goal was really to kind of tear down how I viewed myself um, in order to build me up in their mindset. And so they had people, they had kids there that were there just primarily for abuse. And then there were other kids that were there that were like myself abused, but then also it was twisted in a sense to try to make me become one of them. Mm -hmm. And, and so it was, it was just very confusing because there were times when they were telling me how ugly and disgusting and worthless I was and that God would never rescue me. There was no God, all these things. And then they, there were other times when they were building me up and saying, okay, you have the power, you have the control, you have just very confusing. Um, and so for me, that's when fear entered my life because I saw some really scary, awful things. Oh, I can imagine. And, yeah. and I mean, the stuff I wouldn't want to see as an adult. No. And, and I can imagine when you hear stuff like that. Now, uh, let me ask you, so if it's the uh, extended family that's taking you off and performing all this and everything, how are they acting around your family and, and in real life? I mean, I know they had to do the Johnny Good Lucky, hey, how you doing, buddy, and everything. You've got to, I mean, you can't put it out there for everybody to know. Uh, I mean, were right. they were they act like they're Christians, like uh, your family? Uh, they just didn't talk about it at all. But, I mean, again, we know they played the game. Yes. You know, on the outside and, and in front of the other people. Yeah. During the day, everything was really normal. Um, actually, the people that we were staying with weren't even the ones that did the abuse. It was other people who had a key to mm -hmm. get into this house, other family members that had a key to get in. And so my family knew that this person wasn't particularly safe. So they never thought that they were leaving us alone. Um with him and his wife. Um, but they didn't know to the extent they had no idea that he worshiped Satan, but they knew they'd known him since he was little and mm -hmm. he had always exhibited, um, you know, behaviors that were scary. Mm -hmm. And so they thought, well, we're just never going to leave our kids alone with them. And they put us to bed, you know, at night thinking we were safe and in a safe place, not realizing that this person had a key and would come in and do that. So, how long did this happen? Take yeah. How long did it take place? It happened before you were able to tell mom and dad. I'm assuming you told mom and dad. Uh, Same yeah. you had to go to somebody anyway. Well, so we okay. So it happened on a few different occasions. Um, when I was four, we went for about a week, and it, it happened on a few occasions during that week that we were there. And it may have happened other times that we visited as well. Um, we did not tell our parents right away because first of all, we were told that we would be killed um, mm -hmm. if we said anything. And then we also were told either we would be killed or that our loved ones would be killed. Um, and so what our bodies tend to do, and I do think it's a gift from God, is that we repress our memories. Mm -hmm. yes. And so for, for both my sister and I, actually, though we processed the abuse very different from each other, we did both repress our memories until we were in junior high. 
Um, and so that's when we did tell our parents. Um, my, my sister, her memory started to come up about the same time as mine because we saw a different extended family member that was really creepy and triggered our memories. It wasn't okay. the person who did it, but he may have done that to yeah, the person yeah. who did it to us. You know what I mean? Same oh, side yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, so he was your, super creepy. And your sister, how old is she again? She's my twin. So twin, she, exactly. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, you said twin earlier. Yeah. Okay. And we're the only two in the family. So it's just only two kiddos. Um, and so when we when we interacted with this person, uh, that's when our memories began to to trigger and we knew like, okay, I think I was sexually abused. So that's kind of where it started was mm -hmm. and my mom was already in counseling. Um going through her own stuff. So she got us connected with a counselor and uh, we were able to process and talk with our counselor through it. And, and our parents believed us. And I think that's the most important thing for, yes, for anybody I've, that comes. I've heard forward. other stories, not what you're talking about, but other abuse, sexual abuse. Yes. And then they talk about how mom or dad didn't believe them. Oh my gosh. And, and, and then that's and then like another was, trauma. Then yeah. Then it's still going on. Exactly. And then finally something happens. And of course, mom or dad may or may not come back apologizing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm glad to hear that you said that uh, your family yeah. recognized Believe what that. you were talking about and believed you. Yes, they did. They did. It could have been a lot worse. It could have, it really could have. Um, but for me, you know, the way that I processed it in my, my, you know, brain, my middle school brain, uh, you know, you're already going through so many changes in middle school. If you think about oh, middle yeah. schoolers, they're, they're hormonal and angry and, you know, whatever, who am I, you know, I taught, <laughs> I taught seventh grade science for about yes. 14 years. So yes. I know all that going on there. Yes. Yeah, you do. You get it. And so, um, for me, I just got really angry. I really pushed my family away, pushed my sister away. A lot of, uh, my oh, wow. You're, you're, so you yeah. and your sister did experience this together. We you did. Were, yeah, but I was were, very You angry. were pushing away. Yeah. Was she trying to come to you? Was she pushing away as well? Um, no, I mean, I, she just, just she just handled it more normal, so to speak. Okay. I mean, I don't know if there's a normal way to process through this kind of thing, but yeah. she had a pretty normal um uh, you know, middle school years, she just had to process through it. And she talked with my parents, she talked with our counselor and she was more sad. Um, and, and, and such, I was more angry. So there's mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. she, she talked about it. I kept it all inside. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, she drew closer to my parents and I was just angry with the world. So, you know, and who knows why one of us responds a certain way versus another. Yeah. I know we were abused very differently um, because that is part of the satanic um, abuse is that no person is necessarily traumatized the same because it's all about hitting you right where it hurts, you know, getting, yeah. getting that person, uh, deconstructing that person as best you can. And so they viewed her more as a victim and somebody that they would abuse. I was given more of the, you know, they wanted to unleash the anger. Yeah. If that makes sense. And the control. So for me, that's how I responded. And so I pushed everyone away. But for some reason, I drew closer to God during that time in my life. I was a, a middle schooler. Like I said, it was the summer before my seventh grade year that I started to remember everything. And I just drew close to God. My family went to church. And so I just remembered feeling really safe in church. There were times that I don't know if it was during the Advent season, I was raised Lutheran. And so we had, you know, evening services sometimes mm -hmm. when, the, when the, during Advent or during, um, you know, different, different things that were going on. But, but I just remember going to some of those evening services and feeling such comfort being in church. And um, I, you know, I felt like I, God gave me dreams where he was with me during really horrible things in my dreams. I just felt his presence. I don't know another way to explain it other than he was the only one I felt safe with, with my heart. Yeah. And um so, you know, going through middle school, processing through the, the grief and the anger, but then high school, I really wanted to push everything away. I just wanted to be normal. <laughs> I just didn't want to think about it. So I pushed it away. But when I went to high school or to college, um, that's when the memories of the satanic abuse started to come back full force. You know, I'm away from my family. I, I'm beginning oh, to- on your own now. I'm yeah. on my own. I moved to a completely different state. Um, and began to really just, first of all, I, 
we had a pastor come and speak at my school um, and he, he basically an evangelist. And that's what he was. I mean, he came and he spoke to hundreds of students, which my college had never seen that happen before. They weren't a college that did that a lot. So that was not the norm. But we had this guy come and preach and he shared, you know, the full gospel, which means the full good news of what mm -hmm. Jesus did and the death that he experienced, the, you know, what he did for me. And it was like, it was the first time I had ever fully heard it. And he talked about, Hey, if you want to give your life to Jesus, if you want to not just say, um, you know, God, I, I invite you into my heart, but you're saying, I want to surrender my life to you because how I'm living is not working. I need help. If you want to do that, he said, don't just raise your little pinky finger, stand up on your feet, and make it a public declaration to everybody. And before I knew it, I was on my feet and so were hundreds of other people. I mean, it was just this crazy God moment where I knew I want to surrender my life. And from that point forward, that's when, when the Lord began to reveal more of the trauma that happened because he knew that I could lean on him and really yes. begin to process with him through it. Yeah, I'm sure you got as you were younger and growing middle school and stuff and going to, I'm sure you've heard if you want to be saved, do all of this. But here it seemed like God had you prepared by planting all the seeds going up. Right. And then all of a sudden you're going, he's talking to me. Yes. You know, this message is me only because yes. it's, it's hitting you right where your comfort zone is now. That's exactly right. And if it was up to me in my own little brain, there's no way I would have stood up because <laughs> I was terrified. But I felt the I felt like God's presence gave me the strength to stand and say, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I, mm -hmm. I have to have him. I'm going to stand up. And it was just this crazy moment for me where uh, that started me on this journey of getting connected with a church. Um, and in that church, lots of people were able to pray for me and pray with me through those really hot, horrible memories that came up. Um, and so that was really helpful. And another thing, you know, we talk about how do we get through it, right? How did we persevere? Well, people, um, people can hurt you, but people can also help you. And, um, you know, obviously I was tremendously hurt by people when I was younger, but then when I'm able to experience um, God's love through people meeting with me and praying with me and listening to me and telling me you're not crazy, that was really helpful. I had a, I had a pastor's wife who actually sadly had gone through the same thing I went through. I mean, different experience, but she had been satanically abused. So it happens more than we know, which is so sad. Um, but she was able to help me through it and walk me through um, and make me not feel crazy. There's no way I would have probably believed myself if I didn't know somebody else who'd gone through it because you just yeah. don't hear about it talked about. But I, I knew that what I had experienced was real because none of my thought processes were normal for me, like I said, fear was huge. So I was terrified in junior high when the memory started to come back. Most junior hires, you know, you worked with them. They want independence. They want to be left alone. Mom and dad are leaving. Yay. I'm going to be home alone or I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go to the mall with friends. For me, that was the last thing I wanted because I was always afraid I was going to be kidnapped or killed or, um, or what have you. And so to yeah. me, I never felt safe. Um, and so you know, going off to college and I'm driving a car, you know, and I'm driving to the store, I constantly would hear in my mind, you're going to be killed. Your car's going to break down. There's just no one's safe. Everybody's creepy. It's kind of, you know, that mentality when you're on alert, that trauma puts you on alert with everybody. And so to be able to process and pray with people through that and to begin to recognize that, that fear is not my friend. I don't want to find comfort in that fear or validity in that fear, I need to say no to it and begin to uh, do the opposite of what fear is telling me. If it's saying, don't, don't go to that church service or don't go to that grocery store, you're going to be killed. Then I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to go just to defeat that. Yes. Yep. Hey, now a couple of questions here. One, um, you're talking about you know, going by yourself now to the, uh, college and so how did sister mm. end up doing did she become as strong as you did she uh, yeah. okay also a uh, question here please tell me that uh, something happened to these people okay uh locked up or something okay and the last thing is um when you were talking about uh, middle school, want to be independent and everything, they're looking to be in that group that's going to accept them. Right. And I remember telling several parents 
when we would have our parent conferences and um, would tell them, say, they could say, they, I mean, they would just go, I just don't know how to reach them. They're, they're the teenagers. They don't want to listen to a word I have to say. I said, well, I'm letting you know now. Uh, you need to find something that both of y'all, all of y'all can uh, relate to. Yeah. Because if you don't, they're going to get into something. You're not going to like it. That's so true. And so, you know, if, they, if they're big in sports, you better do everything you can to keep them in sports, church, whatever else, do everything that you got so to That is so wise. Keep. Yes. Yeah. And it said, because if you let them wander off and you don't know what's going on, you, you may not like what they run into. That's so. exactly right. All right. So yeah. the question again, the sister and repercussions. Um, okay. Yeah. So my sister uh, ended up going to a different college and, uh, you know, we were actually, because we were twins, my parents were really big on making sure that we had our own identities because you can easily, easily, one of the words we learned in counseling all the time was enmeshment. You know, you could become mm -hmm. enmeshed, which is an unhealthy bond. And so they said, you're not allowed to go to the same college. So we- I wonder went, if they use that word with the Siamese twins. Enmeshed? Yeah. You know, you're going, well, you, you my, need to be separate, but they can't be separate, but right. they still have their own mind- thinking. I know I'm jumping us off a track here. Lily, no, but, but I'm you maybe sure. started thinking, wait a minute. How well, do you tell sign these twins? Well, yeah, because enmeshment is really like a, yeah. it's more of a psychological, emotional yeah. thing. I mean, so it's it, still, they can, as long as they both have their own brain waves, yep. they can still get that comfort to be their, to be their own. As best they can. My goodness. Yeah, I can't yeah, even yeah. imagine what they go through. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that would yeah. be so hard. But oh. so my sister went off to college and then she ended up getting connected with a, uh, a counselor who specializes in satanic ritual abuse. And so she has met with that. She doesn't right now anymore, but she met with that person for years and years. And it was very helpful to her. And she did find the same strength and freedom. And she is a strong Christian as well, um, who has found a lot of her freedom and her from this stuff through Jesus and through her relationship with yeah. God. Which is very interesting because there has her counselor was telling her, you know, it's very rare to find people who have gone through what we went through that, that, um, you know, are able to continue in their faith. Be and I can see that. I can understand it because, because they're questioning God. Why, yes. why did you leave me? Why did you forsake me? Yeah. Why did you let me go through all this? What you weren't there protecting me. Right. Yeah. I, I can see that. Yes. But okay. you know, one of the things that I have learned about processing through trauma is when you get some distance from it emotionally, physically, and you're safe and you can process, you can actually look back on your life and get some real perspective to see that God really did intervene. And he really was there in there's ways that he kind of shows up and he shows you that he was there, even though we have to go through hard times sometimes. And he doesn't want that to happen. He did not want my sister and oh, I yes, to go through yes. that. He hates it. Um, but he gave free will, you know, I mean, we have free will to do that. And so there's, there's wicked people out there that do choose evil things and, um, and it's hard. You may, you're making me think of the uh, the uh, poem uh, Footprints. Yes. You know, when you're talking about, you know, yes. like you were there with me, you know, two sets of foot. Then when I went through this, then I see there's only one set of footprint. And then later I say two again. And again, and they're questioning. And then they say, why? Why was yeah, there only exactly. one set yes, when I was going exactly. through the hardest time ever? And he says, because that's when I carried you. Exactly. Yes. Yes. So I, I, I got a, I, my next book coming out is... Um, I may have to reframe the title now after thinking of this, but yeah. I'm, I'm in a wheelchair. I don't know if you know that, but I got my neck broke playing yes. football and paralyzed. Wow. And um, um, uh, my next book, I'm about, about done with it. And it's, it's right now it's titled, it's like I said, I may have to change something here, but it's, uh, and, you know, you know, those saying until you walk a mile in my shoes. Yes. You know, mine is until and where it says mile or walk, I got it crossed out. And shoes crossed out, and it says, "When you travel a mile in my tracks." Oh, I love that. So, wow, that's so, really powerful. So, you know, it still has the word, you know, walk and yep, uh, tracks or whatever uh, footprint, travel. whatever it is. Yeah, yes. yeah, it did, but I, yeah, play the scenario with the wheelchair. I so, love that. Um, oh my gosh, that's that's going to be powerful. So, but uh, yeah, so yeah. The, I remember the first time uh, uh, I was in rehab, a, a woman was telling me about the uh, 
footprints. Wow. Uh, I actually have that uh, hanging on my wall in my bedroom. That that one, it, it's powerful. I so, remember reading that for the first time. I feel like I was in high school. I don't know if it's been around that long, but I, I feel like I was. I'm a little older than you. And so <laughs> it's, it's it's been out for a while, yes. Okay, okay. Um, but I remember it really ministering but to well, I say I say older than you. I mean, I know I'm well older than you, but- um, I don't know. Um, how, how old are you? I don't mind saying how old 58. I am. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm 42. Yeah. I was going to say 58, but but I didn't see the poem till after I got in the wheelchair. So I'd been 20 something. So okay. I don't know how, yeah. but there, did you know there's a second version of that? Uh, no. Someone's come up with it and I have to go back and reread it, but I forgot what exactly. But yeah, yeah. It, I'm going to look that there's up. A, there's a second version someone replayed on it. Wow. So, oh man, I wish I knew that video and that song. Is it dancing in the sky? And some woman at the singing on YouTube yeah. and she's taking that scenario and changing it. And it's beautiful. Wow. I, I, I'll see if I can send that link to you. Yeah, I do. It, 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 it's powerful. The way she turned it over um, to the song. Cause I yeah. think we can all really relate to that. I mean, some of us may not be able to recognize yet, or we haven't heard, you know, God say, that's when I carried you. But in reality, that doesn't mean that's not what happened. And so I think, the oh, more, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The more distance that we get from the pain and the hurt and the, and just when we can be in a safe place and safe relationships, we can start to look back and go, oh my gosh. Yeah. I had, we no can finally idea. look back with a clear mind and conscious yes. and clear vision. You say, all right, God, you were there. Yes. Yep. <laughs> but don't let it happen again. Oh my gosh, Lord, please, so, God, no. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. all right, and then. Well, so now let's, uh, the repercussion, anything? I was just going to answer the exactly because right, I was okay. like, oh yeah, you asked me about repercussions. Okay. Okay. That's the part that's not so fun, but no, there, there is no re repercussions. There will be eternally, um, potentially, yep, yep, yep. unless, you know, they turn to, to the Lord and, uh, and really, Ask for forgiveness with true repentant hearts. I'm not saying just a flippant, sorry, I don't want to go to hell. So no, sorry, no, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But, and again, the sad thing about that point is we're not the judgment. That's I mean, right. We, we have to accept, all right, they did ask, they did. If they truly are man it, then I'll see them there. Because I've asked people this question. There, believe it or not, there's people who really don't care for me. And, <laughs> and, <Aww>. and <laughs> oh, no, I. Believe you don't care for me. And and then uh I would I would laugh to him and say, Hey, I'll see you in heaven. They'll roll their eyes or something. And oh, okay. uh, I go like yes, I say, Hey buddy, you say neither you're gonna meet me in heaven because that's where you think you're going. Mm -hmm. All right, because I think I'm gonna be there. Right. I said, I said, but if you can't stand it, I'm there. So what are you gonna do if Hitler is there? Right. And they go, What? I said, Who knows before he's supposed to commit suicide? God, I am so sorry for what I've done. I I know it's too late for me to do the whole repent, uh, but I oh man! And then he pops that sign and peel in. I said, "Who's to say he didn't do that?" I know, and that I mean, the likelihood is probably not. But he, you know, exactly, what? probably God not. Knows, God knows, and that's the thing. I think when we've okay, so that's a journey, right? That's an that's a journey of forgiveness because for me that was not like I'm saying it here and now. Oh, you know, if he if he repents, then maybe he'll be in heaven. That doesn't mean that's how I always felt. Um, yeah. I was, you know, I had times of really being angry, angry at him, you know, angry at all, you know, the abusers are ang angry at the world, um, angry at the enemy. Um, but I feel like one of the things that as, as you again, begin to get to a place of safety and, and clear and clarity, you can say, okay, like God begins to give you that forgiveness that maybe you need. And sometimes you, it's not just a feeling. And that's something that I talk about in my, in my new book, where I talk about what happened, the fullness of the abuse that happened, but well, not like graphic detail or anything, but basically, is it that well, book? Nope, that's the children's book. And I'll no, be excited. No, that's the children's book. Yeah, okay. the other one's not out yet. So well, let's the come other back. One... Well, let's come back to this in just a minute because I want to ask a question. I, I was just saying you were talking about that, and so dumb me. What I no! told you, I'm not, told you I'm not a professional at this. No, so, uh, you how are, did you know? No, that's okay. Uh, but uh, let me ask this question: You're talking about anger of everything. Yeah. This may be a hard question. I don't know if you ever had it. And, were you ever angry, angry with mom and dad for taking you to those place, to the house, not to where you got, uh, you no, know, they didn't put you there to be picked up and taken. Right. Y'all went to visit or whatever you did, yeah. you know, all their earnest was, was genuine Christian like, yeah. but then did you, did you go, 
if you wouldn't have took me over there, this wouldn't have happened. You know, in my brain, that is not how I processed it. You know, I did get really angry with them, but I couldn't pinpoint why. I just was angry. Yeah. Um, you know, just kind of a response. But in my brain, I didn't connect. I'm angry with you because you brought me there because I also knew they were going through a lot of pain realizing what happened to us. And now that yeah. I am a mom, I can't even imagine what my parents went through when they realized, you know, oh, what yes. happened. I, I think I'm putting my kids to bed in safety and then this happened. So no, that isn't the direction that my, but that my mind went, but I was angry. I just wasn't angry, angry. And I would have a lot of dreams where, um, you know, something was happening to me and my parents had like headphones on and couldn't hear. So I wasn't angry with them, but I felt unsafe you know? Yeah. 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 So there were dreams like that where, where I was being, it was able to show me, you know, I feel unsafe. I feel like they didn't protect me, but I, it wasn't their fault. And I, and I, somehow I kind of knew that the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for, for me, like when I was saying just that anger or that forgiveness is a choice, you know, there's a gal that I just has always been a huge hero of mine and her name is Corey Ten Boom. And I don't know if you've ever heard of her or if your listeners have, but she lived during the Nazi Germany era. Okay. And so she, she experienced a lot of awful things and she was protecting her family was a Christian family. They were protecting the Jews. She wrote a book called the hiding place and, um, okay. Yeah, which a lot of people had to read in school. And so she she um, hid Jews in her home. And because of that, she was sent to a concentration camp and her sister died there and she experienced absolutely horrendous things. Well, after the war, she survived. She was the only family member that survived the war that went to concentration camps. And she um, was speaking one day to a crowd of Germans and she was telling them it was in a church and she, and they had all come to hear her story. And she was talking about God's forgiveness and how she had forgiven um, the people who had done these things to her. Well, then this man comes forward afterwards. And as soon as she sees him, she recognizes him as one of the guards from the concentration mm, oh, camp. Wow, okay. And she knew he was one of the most ruthless. And he did not remember her because he abused thousands. Yeah. But um, she knew who he was and she got so angry. I mean, she she tensed up and she couldn't believe it. She had no words. And he came forward and he said, you know, I have given my life to Jesus. I've asked him for forgiveness for the sins that I've committed. And thank you for talking about this forgiveness. But I want to know, will you forgive me? And she basically in her mind, she was like, oh, Lord, help me because I mm. cannot do this. I, I am so angry right now. And God met her right there. And without any feeling, she chose to reach her hand forward to shake this man's hand and choose forgiveness. And as soon as she did, God met her and she felt like this heat go through her arm. And, and, and she began to sob and said with her whole heart, I forgive you. I forgive yeah, you. Yeah. Now, we don't all feel that when I chose to forgive my abusers, I didn't have this huge emotional reaction, but it was a choice of saying, you know what? I recognize that something must have happened to them in their childhood yeah. or adulthood that turned them into this angry, yeah. rageful person. And so I choose to forgive them for what they did, not just for them, but for me, for my freedom and my healing. And that's a lot of, you know, anyone who's gone through trauma, like with the Rwandan genocide that happened in, in the nineties. A lot of it, a lot of the people who experienced um, the loved ones being killed by other tribe members, they literally had to learn how to release those that did that to them so that they could experience freedom. Because otherwise you feel bondage. You feel like you're in bondage to that person who abused you. And, and I don't want any connection with them at all. So I want to let go and I want to forgive and be able to move forward with my own healing, if that makes sense. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And also remember when you uh, do forgive, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be best buddies with them. That's exactly right. You and know, sometimes can, it means you, you forgive, forgive and you prosecute. You still have, they still have yeah, to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Even if, yeah. You, and that's you one go, of the things. I forgive you, yep. but you need to pay for your penalties. <laughs> you know. Well, and that's one of the things I guess I, I think I forgot to say, but in terms of the repercussions is, you know, re repressed memories don't go over well in court. Um, and so there's nothing that I really can do in that regard, but what I can do is share my story and I can pray that, that the people that did that come to 
come to the Lord because um, because the enemy who they worshipped want, wants them to go to hell. And so I want the opposite of what the enemy wants. Yes. So um, I'm going to I'm going to pray that they that they be that they be healed and, and that they would not do this to anybody else as well. It, it um, will. But there's not, I mean, there's nothing in, legally that I can do. Um, and I can't even say who it is because if I did, you know, then they could come Defamation after me. Defamation of character. Right. And so, but no I can't. No matter what they did, but you can, yeah. you'll be penalized for it. Yeah. So. But that's okay. God knows. And there's justice. And I, and I do pray that that justice happens with, you know, even if it well, means it's, it's obvious that God has made you a strong woman to get out there and share your story and what you should. Yeah. And because it's going to help somebody else in the long run. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, I'm, I, I tell people I, to, to, that I'm glad I got to meet you. Uh, you just your story is so strong. Mine just broke my neck and paralyzed. So what? But yeah. Um, but you have to live it every single day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I tell people, you know, on some things, not everybody gets reminded on what they've been through or gone through. But right. mine is every day getting into every the wheelchair. Day. That's but, right. Uh, but uh, yeah, but you know the world, world built different, and you know I hear people say to me, oh, "I couldn't do what you're doing." Well, you don't know; you're not my situation. Right. I said, "For all I know, I couldn't go through cancer." You right. know, uh, so I couldn't go through the abuse you've been through. But you, you don't know what you can go through and tell you, which I pray people don't have to go through anything really. Right. But right. reality, it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Um, but pray that they find its strength to get through and to help others. Because for you, Amen. what, you, what you went through, you wouldn't have had a professor of perseverance podcast if you had not had to learn how to persevere. So, and there's so many people that need that right now. They need to hear that so badly. And so you're being, you're choosing to, to make it a voice for good instead of just being really what we all could be, which is depressed and just really not doing anything about, you know, helping other people because we're just trying to survive. But for you, you're choosing to help. Well, and my point on this is just providing a platform for all of you to get your stuff out. That's people right. don't want to hear my story anymore. I've done it for 20 years. Right. So, so, <laughs> so I, I get tired of telling it. Okay. So I, I just felt I, I attempted suicide three times in three days, how bad I wanted out. Wow. And that was only 12 years ago. Wow. And that has led to me getting to public speaking, writing books, um, doing a YouTube positive channel, and then now this. Yeah. Okay. And the, again, this is not for me. People are tired of hearing me. It's for you and everybody else I can get on here to spread their message to help somebody in the long run. Well, thanks for giving us a platform to do that. So, you, well, you're welcome. Man. I'll expect a check in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So, uh, no, now let's go back to your books. Okay, this one here, I got a copy of. You said it's your children's book. Yes. So yes. go ahead and explain to uh, about this and yeah. how people can find it. Okay, so you can find it on Amazon or any online online bookstore. It's it's everywhere, Barnes and Noble, everything. Um, it's called She Rows of the Bible, and it's about the women heroes of the Bible. And one of the threads in their in all of their lives, these women, there's there's twenty women, 26 women, 20 stories, 26 women. Um, but the, one of the threads throughout their lives is they all dealt with fear. There was all something that they were afraid of that they experienced fear with, whether it was fear of having a child or fear on the battlefield or whatever it was. And God met them and he gave them the strength to endure and get through and change history and change the lives of others. So I wanted kids to be able to realize that there's women in the Bible that are dynamic and incredible, just like there's a lot of amazing men in the Bible. We need to know about these women. And my daughter was seven years old when she sparked me to write this because she said, mom, why does God like think that boys are more important than girls? All we ever learn about in church are boys. And so I was like, wow, we got to start talking about these incredible women. And when I found out there's like, there's way more than 26 women in the Bible, but these are 26 women that I felt like were heroes. And so um, I got to write a book about that. So that's on there. And, um, and then my, my new book is going to be out in the spring of 2023, spring or summer, somewhere around there. And that is my actual story of what happened and then how I processed and worked through that. Um, and okay, the, the title hasn't been solidified yet, but currently it's a garden in the ashes, rebuilding your heart and world after trauma. So that's the subtitle. So, yeah. 
Oh, it's awesome. So I'm like your daughter. Yeah, then we, we need to be going to church to find more about these women folk. That's and right. Hey, I remember my mom, single mother, raised three boys. Wow. Um, and I never met my real father. They divorced before my first birthday. She remarried. And then he died when I was 16. So she basically, oh. for 10 years, she was married. Uh, but basically, she raised three boys uh, wow. from there. And I remember in the 70s when the women were out burning their bras because they were equal to men. <laughs> and so I was out there burning my mom's bra on their side. And were so, you really? Are you no, serious? I, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I thought, what a story. That is. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll tell you, like uh, I used to tell my students when I was teaching, I'm an honest liar. Okay. I'll lie to you. Then I'll tell you when I'm lying to you. Right. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, but in your heart, you were burning her bra. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, cause, hey, yeah, women go. She, uh, I, Anybody ought to say their mother is the strongest woman they know. Uh, and I know in some cases it's not true. Right. But hopefully a foster parent or a guardian mother, something they could look back and that's the strongest woman they know. Yeah. And again, my mom, 82 years old and beat cancer three times and wow. uh, congestive heart failure. Just thought we were going to lose her early this year in pneumonia. She fought back and she's back to her 82 year old self. That's so, amazing. She sounds amazing. She's a, it's, she's actually in chapter one of my first book that I wrote. Oh, and she's awesome. yeah, talking about her. And I took the mother acronym for mother and wrote M for whatever, O for whatever. So, right. Oh, I love that. So, all right, Lauren. And so um, go ahead and tell the people your uh, website, tell the social media, how they can find you. Yeah. So uh, my website is laurenlnelson.com. Super easy. And then my uh, Instagram is the Lauren L. Nelson. And uh, on Facebook, you can find me at She Rose of the Bible. So good deal. Yeah. And I'll get those links put in the show notes for other people to help uh, make it easier to find you. Awesome. So. All right, Lauren. Hey, I appreciate meeting you and appreciate, uh, uh, again, sorry what have you been through, but I'm so glad to to meet the new and improved you. Yes. I will say that new and improved you, and I'm glad I uh, uh, got to meet you. So Thank you uh, so much. And you're just so positive. Now, let me ask this question here, because I've asked before to other people, was Lauren this positive and happy-go-lucky beforehand? Even before going through, is it four years old? Yeah. I guess it'd be hard to determine. Or, yeah. Boy, you were talking about fear earlier, mm -hmm. uh, fear of everything. So, may, and so maybe you just, during all this, develop the more positive stuff uh, in you. Yeah, well, and for me, I mean, honestly, people talk about God giving them joy. And some people think, oh, that's so cliche or that. No, really. He's the only reason that I have hope and joy and uh, enthusiasm and excitement for, for life. I mean, he gave me that as part of my personality, but it was pushed down for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and he helped me find that again. And so that's been that's been a huge part of it. Yeah. Amen, sister. And medication. So because there's a lot of stuff that happens, you know, in your brain, in your in the chemistry of your body when you experience trauma, especially as a child during those growing periods. And so I I do um, I found in the last you know few years that I do need to be on an anti anxiety because of my my body being at a constant you know fight or flight. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So um, I do have that to kind of help help stabilize. And that has do brought you, me back to the best, my best self. Do you continue seeing a therapist? No, you know, I've seen a therapist on and off, but okay. the really cool thing is, is, um, you know, and there'll be times in my life where I'll need to go again for uh -huh, different yeah. things, but, um, God has me right now in a program where I am actually learning to be, I'm becoming certified to be a tra trauma and resiliency life coach. There you go. Awesome. Yeah. So That's that in the great. next six yeah. months or so, I will be licensed for that and be able to take clients. So my hope is to be able to help others in that regard as well. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad you mentioned that in here. Yeah, me too. <laughs> all right. Uh, so other than that, I think we've done all we can except for um, Lauren. Uh, we know people hurting and struggling today. And if you can leave us with a positive message, some golden nugget they can hang on to, that'd be a blessing. Absolutely. Okay. So I'll say it in short is my motto is let God's love be greater than your fear. 
Um, and that's a choice to say, yes, I'm going to choose to have God's love be greater than any fear that I can ever face because it's the truth and it's clinging to that truth. But here's one other thing I'm going to leave you with a little visual. My, um, I had a friend of mine that was going through, um, a really difficult time. She was addicted to some painkillers because that was her way of numbing her fears and her pain that she had experienced in trauma as a child. And, um, she was meeting with a counselor and the counselor said to her, what's on the other side of fear? And she said, oh my gosh, I have no idea. Like all she could see was her fears. And he said, but what's on the other side? And she said, I don't know. And he said, everything you've ever wanted, everything, oh, yeah, yeah. your heart desires, everything you were made for, created for, everything you want on the other side of fear. So if we can get past that fear, which is a choice to punch it in the face and say, I refuse to let fear stop me from X, Y, and Z. I refuse to let it stop me from getting on this podcast. I refuse to let fear stop me from writing a book or from speaking in front of people or from meeting with a neighbor, whatever it is from the smallest to the greatest things. We have to say no to fear so that we can get to everything we've ever wanted on the other side. There you go. So, yeah, that, go. It's all, it's, uh, yeah thinking about the, uh, what's on the other side, everything you've been afraid of and doing. And it, not experiencing. so And everything you've always wanted to do that like yeah. sounds so amazing, yeah. but you have no idea how you're ever going to get there. It's punching fear in the face one day at a time. <laughs> there you go. That's what I like. You know, it's uh, it's uh, Mike Tyson and he says, yes. everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. That's right. That's so, right. Yeah. So uh, from just there. punch him back. There you go. <laughs> and then on Rocky, get another quote to Rocky uh, in movies. It's not how... It's not getting up off the uh, mat. It's how fast you get up. Wow! From the from the uh, punch. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I can do several of these uh, mm -hmm. things. Uh, or it's not how fast. It's how you get up. I don't know how how did that go. But if you get up, I mean, just get up. If you get up right. slow, you get up. But you just get up daily. Get up and say, I. Some for some people, it's I got to climb out of bed. That's their way of punching fear in the face. I don't want to get up, but I'm going to climb out of bed. I'm, I'm going to, you know, you know how you can do quotes and they find people and they give you all these people that gave you different, I'm, I'm going to get mine, I'm going to get mine labeled and hopefully one day it'll be put up there, everybody can find it. And it's going to be, um, sometimes we have to walk through the fertilizer or the crap, however you want to put it. Sometimes <laughs> we have to work through the fertilizer to get to the rose. I love it. So, all right, I'm going to get that up there one day and hopefully somebody's going to remember it 100 years from now. Do it. So. I love it. I love all right, it. Lauren, thank you for being here. Hey, everybody else, thank you for coming in. Hey, B, uh, a, uh, AJ and Brittany, thank you for coming in and uh, thank you all for listening. And so we'll catch y'all, what you say, on the flip side to YouTube. All right, so everybody else, hey, thank you. Share us out to, for someone you know. They don't have to be going through some big traumatic everything like yeah. Lauren went through. It's the message of how she got through it. Right. is what's the important thing. So everybody else, hey, I'm Dr. James Perdue, the Professor of Perseverance. Thank you for listening to the Professor of Perseverance podcast. Do something today, tomorrow, something next week that's going to help you persevere past your paralysis.